A lobster has only two eyes, but each is made up of thousands of smaller eyes. Such an eye as a lobster's or an insect's is called compound. So the thing the lobster looks at is apparently made up of dots. Most worms have no eyes at all. The clam worm does have eyes, but they are so crude that he doesn't see very clearly. To the clam worm, a human and a big fish probably look alike. Both are just shadows to him. To us, human eyesight seems just about perfect. As a matter of fact, most birds and even some lizards see much better than we. Nevertheless, our eyes are truly wonderful mechanisms. The human eye, like a miniature camera, has an iris to regulate the amount of light coming in and a lens. The shape of the lens of the eye can be changed by tiny muscles to suit the distance at which it has to work. The eye has a dark chamber and a sensitive layer called the retina, a counterpart of the film in the camera. And back of the retina is a layer of black tissue, which, like the black paint inside the camera, prevents reflections which would blur the image. For an object to be seen sharply, the light rays coming from it to the eye must be focused so that an image falls exactly on the retina. This eye, which is nothing but a camera in the shape of an eye, shows us what we would see if we had no lens. Rays from the object are so mixed and confused that we see nothing but a blur of changing light. But when we put a lens in the camera, rays of light from the object are controlled. They are bent and aimed at correct points on the retina. That is why we have a lens and cornea on the eye to bend or refract the rays. From each point on an object, the light is reflected in all directions. All the rays of this reflected light, which are aimed toward the aperture of the eye, are bent by the cornea and lens so that they come to a single point inside the eye. This is what we mean by focusing. From every other point on the object, the light is focused at a corresponding point inside the eye. In this way, a clear image of the object is built up. Because the rays cross, the image is upside down. The muscles attached to the rim of the lens regulate the curvature of the lens surface so that the image falls on the retina and is seen sharply. The retina consists largely of nerve fibers. On its back surface are the so-called visual cells, the rod visual cells and the cone visual cells. A light ray which strikes the transparent retina passes through it to the outer parts of the visual cells. Chemical changes caused by the light start a nervous current back through the retina along its inner surface and out through the optic nerve to the brain. Here, a sensation of light is aroused. The rod visual cells are hooked up in groups to one optic nerve fiber so that they cooperate in setting up a nervous current. For this reason, they can cause a current flow in very dim light. The cones, however, are not usually hooked up together, so the light must be brighter before the cones can function. At night, therefore, only the rods can function. But because a whole patch of rods is connected with each brain cell, each point is registered as a blur and things are not seen sharply. When the light is brighter, the cones come into play because each cone has a private wire to its own brain cell. They provide the sharp details of the picture. But the cones, the organs of sharp, bright light vision, do more. They give us the fascinating world of color. In each cone, 
are three chemical substances. Each substance is sensitive only to a particular group of colors. Thus, one is most sensitive to red, one to yellow, and one to blue. When a particular color of light strikes the cone, the corresponding substance breaks down and the corresponding nervous current flows to the brain. When a different color, yellow for example, strikes the cone, the yellow substance sends a nervous current to the brain. And when blue light strikes the cone, a still different nervous current informs the brain of the color. However, the cones do even more, for they can create a corresponding nervous current for any and all colors by a combination of their sensitive chemical substances. When all three substances are broken down at the same time, we get a combination of all three colors, which we see as white light. White light affects all three of the substances because white light contains all the colors. If we pass a beam of light through a prism, the colors are sorted out from each other and a spectrum is formed. Now, if we reflect the red end of the spectrum onto a screen by means of a mirror, then reflect the yellow portion, we can mix these two colors. Reflecting the blue end of the spectrum onto the screen takes all of the components of white light, and we have only to slide the blue spot over onto the orange to get white light back again. That is why we are able to see mixtures of two color rays as one color. We don't need green light in order to see green. And we don't need orange light to make us see orange. Mixtures of blue and yellow light and of yellow and red light will create green and orange for us. To make the eye see any and all colors, then only the three primaries, red, yellow, and blue, need be used. From these primaries, a complete color circle can be created. That is why it is possible to reproduce the brilliant colors of nature faithfully with just three primary colors in modern color reproducing processes.